thank you very much uh, for this privilege and chance of uh, sharing on, on what is a, I think, a very important topic, but I have to say right up from the front, I think a very confusing, uh, difficult and rapidly advancing uh, area. Uh, as you've heard, my background is as a, a doctor, a paediatrician, and um, I, I, I went into the field of paediatrics because I love babies and it was a, a fascinating new and rapidly developing area of of medicine, but it's only after I was there that I realized I was in the midst of an ethical uh, maelstrom of issues to do with technology, abortion, uh, intensive care technology, and, and so on. And so ever since then, I've been fascinated by how as technology advances, it raises the question, what does it mean to be human? And I see that question coming back time and time again. And um, I see artificial intelligence as just the next version of the way that it's raising that question, what it means to be human. So my first main question to ask is, is how are rapid advances in AI and digital technology changing our understanding of what it means to be human? And it's important to understand if you look back over the history of um, technology we've always tried to understand what it means to be human by comparing ourselves with the leading technology of the age whatever it was uh, and you can see that all the way back to the ancient greeks um, and here's just one example in the enlightenment period precision clockwork was the most sophisticated kind of medicine and of technology and and so we shouldn't be surprised that um Enlightenment philosophers like Dennis Diderot compared being human with a, with a precision clockwork mechanism. But we're now in an age where the most sophisticated technology which is available to us is the supercomputer. And so we shouldn't be surprised that now thinking of a human being as in some form like a computer or a, like a, an artificial intelligence uh, is um, an idea whose time has arrived. And so humans are increasingly being perceived as being mechanical and deterministic. And here's just one example, Daniel Dennett, well-known secular philosopher. We're not just robots, we're robots made of robots made of robots. In this digital age of supercomputers and smartphones, surely it isn't difficult to imagine how a machine made up of trillion moving parts might just be capable of being human. So that just illustrates how uh, secular thinkers look to a contemporary technology as, a, as a, a way of understanding what it means to be human. But this understanding of human beings as mechanical and deterministic leads on very naturally to the concept that using surveillance techniques and behavior manipulation of human beings is an obvious way for those in power, whether they're political power or in commercial power, this is the way forward um, to, to understand human beings as mechanisms that we can manipulate. And uh, this trend is happening across the world. This is just a screenshot taken from China where each individual face in a crowd has been identified, monitored and coded. And uh, it's not just in China, that this, this technology is in use. In fact, it is being used across the world. Western democracies are being much more uh, quiet about how they're using the technology, uh, but there's no doubt that it is uh, applied in all our countries. And as the technology advances, it's just, astonishing and terrifying the the potential this i just chose this at random it's a it's a tiny little computer chip which you can actually put inside a digital camera uh, but this is what it's capable of doing uh, and so just imagine if every camera on the street in your street or every even a smartphone camera is is constantly doing this kind of processing in order to uh, recognize, analyze um, every human person who comes within the image. 
So this, this, this phenomenon of surveillance and in particular surveillance capitalism, I think is, is one of the defining features of, of the modern age. And, and I think therefore it behoves all Christians who are interested in how to understand our modern age to really educate themselves about what's going on. And this book, uh, it's quite a big tome. Uh, it's, it's rather over long and over wordy, but it's actually an astonishingly important uh, text written by an investigative journalist and academic and um, I recommend it to you if you really want to understand how Google and Facebook and Amazon and all the Silicon Valley giants, how do they make their money? What are they doing to us? How are they manipulating us? And this is a, a very valuable resource. Thirdly, disembodied digital technology becomes preferred and privileged compared with embodied messy interactions. So to technologists, bodies and human to human interactions, physical interactions are incredibly messy and uncontrollable. And the far superior way of communicating and processing is using disembodied digital technology. And so uh, there's this huge trend to prefer the disembodied. And we see this in many, many different uh, areas, but just one line, one area is in, uh, we've seen in the pandemic where uh, digital technology, digital services, uh, online conferences like this and so on. Uh, yes, they're very powerful, but they are constantly telling the message that actually um, it's better to be disembodied than to actually have physical face-to-face -face contact. So these technologies devalue the importance of human embodiment of being a physical person with a body located in a physical time and space, and they encourage the instantaneous transfer, multiplication, storage, analysis, processing of abstract information, ultimately ones and zeros. And yet what's fascinating to me is it's the very disembodiment of digital technology which fosters terrible evils. So much of the evils that we're seeing in the digital realm, like social media abuse and cybercrime, and uh, polarization, trolling, bullying, internet scams, and so on, uh, is directly related to the disembodiment of digital technology. So if you and I were having a conversation in a room alone, physically, and I was to say something to you that was incredibly painful and insulting and humiliating to you, then I could do you great damage. Word can have damage. But that damage is limited to the two of us. And what's more, the fact that as I see you flinch or I, I see your behavior, I say, look, I'm sorry, that came out wrong. I didn't really mean that. Please, please forget it. What I meant to say was this. Um, and of course you could go out of the room and you said, you know what John Wyatt said to me? Um, but even so, the, the damage that I've done through my words is very limited by our physical embodiment. But if I do a social media post where I say something uh, very damaging and humiliating and inappropriate, the evil in my words can now be instantaneously transmitted to millions of people. It can be copied, it can be shared, it can be uh, spread on, retweeted and so on. And there's virtually no limit to how many billions of people on the planet who will be exposed to the evil of my words. And that's because of the digital embodiment. So increasingly, I see that our physical embodiment is the way that God has in the, in the creation is a way of limiting the evil that, that fallen human beings can achieve. And, and the, the fascinating thing is as soon as we get into the disembodied digital world, the potential for evil becomes vast and almost unlimited. So that's a fascinating theme, I think, which, which obviously has theological implications. Fourth, as machines become like humans, more and more like humans, the humans become more and more like machines. So machine analogies, you've often, we talk about people being hardwired. We describe people being programmed or suffering from information overload. I'm sure we could all come up with many other examples of where 
the way we think about human beings is increasingly we think of them as machines. But I'm also thinking of the way that when we, inter when as a human being, I interact with a machine, I discover that I have to talk in a certain way if, I, if I'm trying to get speech recognition or if I'm sending a text or, or if I'm interacting with a program, the program will only um, engage with me if I, if I behave in a kind of robotic, machine-like, limited way. So the very interaction with the machine is, is, is making us as human beings less spontaneous, less creative, more hidebound by how we behave. Next, there's growing evidence of serious harm to human beings from the uh, digital world, from digital addictions, from the way people think. Um, what's happening on the internet is that we're all becoming incredibly adept at, at scanning through vast amounts of data at a very superficial level. And there's lots of evidence showing that, that people, particularly younger people, but actually all of us are finding it harder and harder to focus and concentrate on a single analytical line of thought and, and go really deep in, in our terms of understanding because our brains have been affected by this constant exposure to the internet. It's actually changing the way we think. And um, this idea of addiction, I think again is very important. So. In the UK, there was a great deal of public outrage about these things, fixed odds betting terminals, and lots of evidence that certain people were incredibly vulnerable to the addictive power of this technology. And as a result, the government stepped in and banned the use of, um, of these betting machines. Well, at least they very much limited the rewards, the financial rewards that they could pay out. But there's no doubt at all that many of the techniques that Google and Facebook and the other social media and so on, the techniques that they're employing through smartphones and on the internet are just as addictive as these fixed odds bedding terminals. And yet, so far, there's been virtually nothing and no government intervention to try to, for harm minimization, to try to limit the damage that these addictive technologies are doing. And I, I think, just as it may be not impo maybe impossible to just completely ban betting machines, what you can do is try and limit the damage. And the, we, in the same way, I think that as Christians, we need to align with other people who are trying to limit the damage that addictive technology can do. But there's another aspect of, of what's going on, which I find deeply troubling. And to be honest, I think one of the most uh, worrying and disturbing aspects of digital technology and we've seen it in this pandemic. So we've all of us become exposed to at least some basic ideas of epidemiology to do with the virus, the way that the, there's a susceptible population and that one person gets infected and then they pass on the infection to somebody else and then the infection spreads to somebody else and so on. And, and um, many of us have come across this thing, the reproduction number or the R number. And so if the R number is two, then for every infected person, there are two people, then there are four people, then there are eight people, you get this exponential spread. What is so, has been so troubling is at the same time as the physical virus has been doing this across the world, there has been equally a pandemic of disinformation, of lies, of falsehood. And it turns out that those lies and falsehoods spread across the world in a very similar way to the way the virus does, the physical virus does. It, it too has an R number, uh, falsehoods and lies. And what is so troubling is that there is now fairly strong empirical evidence that shows that lies, falsehoods spread much more effectively across the internet. The infection spreads much more effectively than truth. And this is uh, an article which I found very interesting and troubling in published in Science, so before the pandemic in 2018. And these researchers took 1, 126,000 stories from Twitter and they sent these stories to independent, six independent fact-checking organizations. And they asked the fact-checking organizations to to come to a conclusion as to whether these stories were true or false. And they, by using all these different independent organizations, they came up with a, a, an agreement about which stories were true, which were false. And they then analyzed which, how those stories spread. And what they came to the conclusion is that the stories that were false 
spread farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in all categories of information. Whereas the truth rarely diffused to more than a thousand people, the top 1% of falsehoods, what they call new cascades, they routinely diffused to between a thousand and a hundred thousand people. Falsehoods reach more people at every depth of a cascade than the truth. And so there's something really strange and bizarre about the internet coupled with fallen human beings. And that is, it's almost as though the internet and the algorithms running it have been designed to spread falsehoods, uh, to spread disinformation. And this is sometimes called truth decay, but I see it as a huge problem because is it possible to have any rational discourse in the public square? In, in our network, we've been talking about reasoning in the public square, about having rational debates with our opponents. But is it going to be possible to have any rational discourse in the public square if it's no longer possible to know what is true and what is false? Because it seems to be the very basis of democracy is agreement on certain basic truths. Uh, we can all agree that this is true and that this is false. But if that agreement is because of the, uh, the spread of disinformation, if that agreement becomes impossible, what, what, how can the future of society uh, persist and, and a democratic society? And, and, and what can we as Christians contribute? I think uh, another and very important question is what is the ultimate goal of digital technology? What is the telos? What is the goal? What is the end game? We see technology advancing more and more, but what is it aimed at? What, what do the technologists believe is the ultimate goal, their ultimate achievement? And I think for many technologists, the ultimate achievement is a vision of the future in which this technology enables every aspect of life to become, quotes, frictionless. Every desire, every longing, every interest will be satisfied by the technology instantly and effortlessly. Whatever you want, ping, you can have it. Whatever you're interested in, ping, there's the information. Whatever aspect of entertainment you want, ping, it's there. It's instantly and effortlessly available for us. But the, is that a future, that frictionless future in which physically embodied human beings can flourish and find our ultimate purpose and fulfillment? Because the strange paradox about being human is in order for human beings created in God's image to flourish and develop, it seems that we need resistance. We need friction, we need struggle, we need perseverance because of, we need frustration, we need pain. And if technology is determined to remove all these things, is it going to be possible for embodied human beings to flourish? So I've raised a lot of questions there. And as I come to the end, I just want to talk about how can we defend as Christian people, the essential dignity and rights of human beings in this strange new and rapidly advancing technological world. Well, I think one of the issues, which I think what many of us are aware of is the issue of privacy and of confidentiality. And it's absolutely true that in Christian thinking, maintaining confidentiality and privacy, especially in areas of intimacy and sensitivity and vulnerability, it's an essential part of protecting vulnerable people in a fallen world. And you remember in, in, the, in Genesis 3, after the fall, before the fall, it was possible for Adam and Eve to be completely naked and open to one another, and they were unashamed. But as soon as uh, evil enters into humanity, their first instinct is to cover up their nakedness. And the fascinating thing is that God didn't come along and strip away the covering and says, no, you go back to being naked. In fact, uh, God created um, skins to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. And so I, I think in pictorial language, there is the, um, the recognition that confidentiality and privacy is necessary. And, and this is a very important issue, of course, in, in as a medicine, all, all doctors are 
strongly educated in the centrality of medical confidentiality. And it actually goes back to the Hippocratic Oath three to 400 years before Christianity. And the Hippocratic Oath says, uh, one particular clause of it says, whatever in connection with my professional practice or not, I see or hear in the life of men, which ought not to be spoken of abroad, I will not divulge as reckoning that all such should be kept secret. So the Hippocratic physician took a solemn oath to keep the confidential details that, of people's lives that the physician became aware of. They took a solemn oath to keep it secret. And ever since, uh, doctors have recognized the importance of confidentiality because if I release into the public domain some desperately confidential and sensitive medical information about my patient, I'm damaging the patient, I'm harming them. So in the same way, maintaining sensitive information, uh, confidential information is, is a vital part of, of protecting human dignity. And so I think as Christians, we're going to have to fight more effectively uh, to defend privacy against surveillance, against capitalism, against the political forces which want to hold and use and manipulate information. Second, a theme which has come out from previous speakers, which I completely agree with, and that is that in the Old Testament, uh, time and again, God as a God of justice says that he is most concerned with widows, orphans, and immigrants or aliens. And of course, these are the people in ancient Israeli society who are most vulnerable and open to abuse. And so it, it's God himself who says, I am on their side, I will protect them from harm. So, so the question we have to ask is, as we see the advent of artificial intelligence, uh, who are the widows and the orphans and the immigrants? Who are most vulnerable to abuse uh, through this technology? And then those are the ones in which you as Christian people have to be most on the side of. Thirdly, I find it enormously exciting and encouraging that the Orthodox Trinitarian faith gives us a strong rational and philosophically coherent understanding of precisely why embodiment matters. It's very interesting that a lot of secular people have a sort of intuition that the direction that digital technology is going on is unhealthy. They sense that when they see people spending their whole time in virtual reality or on playing computer games or in social media, they sense that this, isn't, uh, this is unhealthy. But if you challenge them, they have, it's quite difficult for them to find a rational reason for why embodiment matters. After all, if we are simply information processing machines, what's wrong with us processing information in a purely digital form? Whereas the Orthodox Trinitarian Christian faith says that in the incarnation, God himself took on physical form that he was raised as a physical, recognizable, touchable human being. And even Orthodox Christianity teaches that there is a member of the species Homo sapiens seated at the right hand of God the Father at this very moment. The risen Lord Jesus uh, is the new Adam, the, the second Adam. And, uh, and we will in the new heaven and the new earth, we will be physically embodied human beings just as he was after the resurrection. So physical embodiment matters and Christianity explains why. And that I think gives us a new opportunities uh, for having an influence for good in the digital world. So we need to fight to maintain the centrality of physically embodied human to human interactions at the heart of our lives. And that means in particular, vital areas such as health and social care, education, and of course, in our Christian churches, that nothing can replace the human to human interaction of Christian worship. And it's fascinating, isn't it, that the most profound example of that is in the Eucharist or the Holy Communion, that the one thing that in all our online churches that we cannot do digitally is share in communion because in order to, it is the physical interaction of the physical bread, the physical wine, 
we're all one body because we share in one physical bread. So um, there's, there's a huge symbolic significance there of the Eucharist. And so taking practical action, and I've just um, listed some, some ideas, educating and informing church leaders, preachers and Christian opinion formers, I think there's a big task of education working with secular organizations who are committed to defending human rights and protections. So here's an opportunity for co-belligerence, we were talking about with um, previous speakers, encouraging harm minimization techniques, particularly for addictive technology. And then finally, encouraging traditional spiritual disciplines of Sabbath rest, so that we, we resist the 24 seven online uh, culture of fasting so the idea of fasting has always been that we we withdraw temporarily from things even that are totally uh, essential to our life like like food because we are making a point we are not allowing this essential thing to become an idol and so therefore fasting from the digital world it seems to me is going to become important and also accountability that we are accountable to one another as our brothers and sisters in Christ for how we're using digital technology. Uh, here are some suggestions on further reading. Um, and um, I just want to mention, if, you, if you'll uh, forgive this, the self promotion, but there's a book that I, Stephen Williams have been editing, which is going to be published uh, in July by SPCK and uh, this has a, is a multi-author book by a whole number of specialists in different areas, uh, giving Christi all Christians and all giving a Christian perspective on artificial intelligence. Uh, and this is a website, techhuman.org, uh, which um, we have set up uh, specifically to host the conversation between Christians. And so if you're interested, you could get more information there. And finally, this is my, my own website. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share together.